bill in its term until the next municipal election cycle, which was last year. And one of our council members up here ran for that two year seat. That's Janelle Seeley, who's on my left, uh, is serving on the two year seat. The other new council members are serving on the three year seat. So uh, let's do the roll call Councilwoman Heck. We have Councilman Beth here. We have. Yeah. We have Councilman, Councilwoman Seeley, we have Councilwoman Kirk, we have Councilman Colson all here. So we start out with the Pledge of Allegiance, and from that we go on to either a prayer of thought for this evening, and if a member of the audience would like to offer a prayer of thought or a member of the council, you're welcome to do that right after the pledge. So let's start with a pledge. from the people who do travel tag Valley. And I'm with FedEx and UPS drivers and they say Providence does the best job of keeping the, the streets clean in the, in the winter. So thanks to the public works. This is an all hands on deck. I mean, we've got people in our streets department, water department, um, cemetery, <coughs> and all of that. But everybody pitches in uh, whenever we've got snow falling. So that we, like Rob said, we do great things. Some of you 
afternoon. We'll notice that this is a little bit different than what you've been used to. Uh, new year, new report style. Um, we want to provide you information where you can keep up with us uh, at your pace instead of waiting for one or two council meetings to try and catch up. So, um, in reviewing the state auditor policies and the code, uh, monthly summary financial reports and quarterly detailed financial reports are going to be presented. So the monthly ones will be very summarized compared to what you have seen sometimes in the past. Um, you can read through um, my little one page report. Attached to it is also the summary budget report, um, which serves as the financial report for the summary. Um, it shows by each fund, general fund, capital projects fund, which is a subset of the general fund, um, the water fund, the sewer fund, the stormwater fund, and a very newly created secondary water fund that we, we need to be working on. So um, you can look through those. I'm happy to field questions. Um, the, but just to kind of hit a couple of high points on the board and commission activity, we have delegated out some duties and Jesse does our minutes for us and he is really getting quite good at getting those, getting the draft minutes up within just a couple of days. So I think he'd be much better served to check our website and look at the draft minutes to see what's happening in those meetings. If there is something that's that's a real an anomaly or something that we feel like we need to give you a heads up on, Ryan or I will make sure that, that you're informed. But for the day-to-day -day comings and goings, I think looking at, in that direction will really serve you well. Um, so we have Planning Commission, Administrative Land Use Authority, Historic Preservation, and Appeal Authority. Those um, groups are like you. They are governing, or they are um, bodies that require open meetings. Their work be done in open meetings. And so they will be on the open meeting notice, or the public, Utah Public Notice website, and also the city's website. Um, but I will let you know on, on this report what dates they've met. So if you want to go back and, and look, you can find them quickly. The only group that met during the month of December out of that group of boards and commission was the Planning Commission. They held one meeting on December 11th. We're also working on a web page that will be designed for the City Council to have access to as we get preliminary draft information that we feel like we can give you an early heads up on. We will put that on there prior to it. And then from that, the final agenda packets will be put together. Uh, that way, once again, if it's 2 o'clock in the morning and you want to look at something and I'm not there to call at 2 I'm pretty good about being 24-7, but I might sleep through a 2 o'clock phone call. So uh, you can go on and look at those things and, and do some heads up and then shoot, shoot emails. Um, if there's something you would like to have on the website or a message you would like sent via Facebook or Twitter, please send me an email. I've got me, my email address on there. And please copy Ryan. Um, we want to make sure we're on the same page and, and that we don't go in two different directions. Also, um, one of the things that's been kind of interesting to see is the number of people that are signed up for what we call the Providence Pipeline. This is our messaging, electronic messaging tool that we use to notify residents in the city. Um, we have several groups. Um, two of them are related to business, and then we have city events, uh, the newsletter, city surveys, public works. We, and public works, we put things out, um, snowplow information, localized water leak information, things like that. If it's something, we have a recreation that we put a lot of notices out to the people that are wanting to know what's going on in the city as far as recreation activities. And then we have urgent notices. And those are bigger problems. That's if we have a great big water leak that affects more than just a few homes and things like that. We will put those out as <coughs> urgent notifications. So we would like everybody to at least sign up for 
urgent notifications if you're not part of our pipeline please do so and you can sign up for one or all so anyway questions i have one um how does one manage their subscription what service i don't to be able to get the group you should be able to go on and put your password in and then change your groups is that what you were asking yeah i'll just let you help me figure it out if that's not i'll go on and look for you josh and make sure that's how you do it okay thank you brian so at the december council meeting we excused ryan from having to give a staff report but we said we'll give him a month to get his things in here well i'm getting better so i do have a staff report um but uh i don't have it drafted and tied to so oh there's a touch of improvement i just um so first of all um i have sent out to you each of you the master plan uh it has been in progress for just over two maybe three years um so that is taking quite a bit of time so i've dug into that got a got a draft sent it out to the group um had some individual um comments and, and updates i think that could be approved um fairly quickly if i can get your feedback uh on that if you have any substantive feedback or want me to to proceed on that um you know let me know but you should have received copies of that with all of my comments previous to this meeting uh if you haven't if, you have, if your email doesn't work let me know but uh hopefully you're all received that i did get some responses but anyway just so you are aware of that i'd like to be able to get it um maybe wrapped up in the next couple months um if if it's only only my changes that need to be done that are formatting uh, i believe that could be done and ready for february for the february 19th meeting so anyway hopefully we'll see that um but let me know any feedback you have there um so i uh i have a history of finding and looking for grants um at this point we found one uh it had a deadline of the 14th which was yesterday um so we made an application for improvements on providence canyon um providence canyon road improvement it would be the project but this would go from highway 40 starting on or no highway 165 sorry uh from highway 165 on third south uh, proceeding over and then up to forest uh, providence canyon so it does have a, a about a three mile stretch that it will um, go it is a 4.6 million dollar project if we get it but this particular funding opportunity was a 93 percent grant so if we get it we only have we actually have 6.77 percent that would be city match so at that point that's 4.2 million in, in uh, grant application um so we'll continue to look for other funding if, if we can um it is um pieces of this road and, and, and majority of the road is listed in the cmpo um 2050 plan and so this does fit that but it was a project that was needed but unfunded so at that point this would be that probably a 50 50 chance uh, because last time they awarded 50 percent of the applicants which is pretty high so anyway we're hopeful um i have gone through and had an audit performed and done on the personnel policy manual uh you've gotten draft copy of that from previous to this meeting um 80 percent of that i believe is complete i have worked and found the state auditors um items and, and that have identified what uh, policies we would be missing and should be updated um and just need to review with staff and finalize for my and we'll bring that back here probably by february 19th meeting is what i expect um, we are making progress on the GIS. It is one item that was listed in the master plan um, and has been a need uh, of the city. Um, when I got here, we didn't have a GIS or a description of any kind. Um, we do have that now. We have linked uh, with the Cache County. Um, so we have the MPOs, the parcel data. Uh, we also have the state's um, Google Earth, uh, which is more detailed than what a regular Google Earth would be. Um, so we have that we have the sidewalk data we have our planning zoning map updated inside of it and uh, we're continuing to gather data um, as quickly and fast as we can to be up to speed of where we probably should be um, 
um, we have had discussions. Uh, Mayor and I met with um, a fiber option, and we, we are looking at uh, multiple options in order to bring the fiber. Um, we have found that there really are three options. Uh, Utopia is one. Um, this other, uh, which is light speed, is number two or three. You could maintain and let a uh, natural course um, progress, which would be allowing Century Lake or Silver Lake or Comcast to, to naturally do it, which would take a long time. Uh, but the other ones, so I do have a, I do have that type of a summary that I'll give you. Um, but uh, other than that, that's what I have. That. Hopefully we can. Communicate. Hopefully, you feel like you're getting uh, getting the information uh, as we go along. And so, any more discussion on this one? Any more questions? Or anything you need to provide? Do we just want us to email you back about the general plan? And yes, we could. Yeah, or? you could individually send that back to me and, and have comments, and I'd bring it back. It would be discussed here in, in the open meeting, um, probably the February meeting, if I can get those comments, I'd get those fits done. Um, so then. At that point, you can have a full review. We'll look at it, and if there's any modifications, changes after you, you still have that. So these are just comments that you made for us. So, so is our next meeting not till the 19th? Are we having one on the 10th? I would I would have those things on the 19th. If we need something on the 10th, we can. Just have time on the 19th for the next day of town meeting. Um, sure. Unless there's items that come up. There are probably a billion of these grants that open. I don't know if there's one. I just got noticed today that the governor's office had a, a recreation grant that was open today. So yeah, I saw that. I've, I've had it. I've applied for those before. Um, and uh, some of what we need before we go to that one would be a trails master plan. And we need to get on some things uh, before we're ready. Okay, so, but I am aware of that one. Um, also, or the fiber one um, that came out earlier. Um, but at that point, there are some issues with the fiber grant and, and uh, population and, and different things there. Uh, but there is several that will come up. So, but if you see one and you say, hey, have you seen this? Send it my way. Um, you know, I've seen a lot, but I haven't seen them all. So, appreciate it. You said the fiber grant that was brought up um, at the town meeting. Um, do, you have, do you have a population concept there as well? There, there is some uh, conflict with. So I'd have to look at that one, whether it was population that was accounted for. There are some, um, some issues. We'll have to make sure that we qualify on that one. Um, but what we really need to do at this point, if we go with the Utopia, it's not a funding model that that works with. So if we go to an independent model, it might. Um, oftentimes, those are designed for, um, for a century leaks or for some of those that will apply in that they're broadband suppliers. If we choose to do it through a utility, I think that that might work. Um, but I am looking at that one going with fiber as well. But yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Yeah. I don't have anything else to ask anyone. Okay, we covered the staff reports. We've got two. Council meetings that we need to improve the minutes for. Well, one was January 9th, which was the training session. There's a brief summary of that. December 4th, we had a different council. One of our previous council members was present in the audience. I don't have a problem with this here. The current council can approve as drafted the December 4th council meeting. So that's where we're at on that. Why don't we start with the uh, Training session that was January 9th. Does anybody see anything they want to change, amend, add? Council members, do I have a motion to? Uh, I want to amend something. Oh, right. Okay, let's have a motion to accept the minutes from one of the council members, and then I'd like a second, and then we'll, we'll discuss. I have a motion to accept the minutes of January 9th. I make a motion that we accept the minutes of January 9th. Motion, motion from Councilman. Do I have a second? Second. Second from Councilwoman. Okay, so we had a question. Uh, you had a question. So I just online is it's Christina from the Planning Commission. Okay. And Jesse 
transcribes our minutes, so. Oh yeah, sorry about that. Awesome. No, I was I was present for neither of those, so I No, I know I heard I heard you yeah. still raise it. We have a motion and a second. Uh, no further discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And that's a abstain. So we have four ayes and one abstain. Any nays? Okay. All right. December 4th. Everyone had a chance to read through the minutes from December 4th. So I need a motion to accept the minutes of December 4th council meeting. I'll make motion that we accept the minutes for December 4th. Okay. Motion, motion from council and second from council Councilwoman Seeley. Discussion, comments, remarks. See, just a remark that I, I think we're in a bit of a quandary. I wasn't present. I would normally abstain, but seeing as if none of us made a <laughs> yeah. So I'm not mistaken. All of you, all four of you were here. <laughs> in, in, not in, not in, not in, not in official, not in official capacity. capacity. That's, that's true. That's true in the right. audience, but I was there for the full nine. So. Yeah. Yeah. So. All right. We have a motion and a second. Do we want to have any discussion, or can we go ahead and vote? I just had a question about the intersection of one of the corners, short block. That's what's time, time twenty six times seven. Do you have a question about what was discussed? Well, I tried to. Follow up where you see about 300 South and Mr. Pinkley's Road. Can you talk to me? Because uh, I can't find that intersection that exists. So is that record someplace here? I, I or well, two different cuts up here. It was so one helpful to Rob to know which ones that we were pointing out. Yeah, and so it it was. It's the one up on the south end. I was. I knew where she was referring to. It's Spring Creek Road and 300 South. Yeah. yeah. It's near Breaker Park. Anyone else? Council? All right, let's take a vote. All in favor of approving the minutes for December 4th? Say aye. 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 Is there a motion? Yes, we have a motion and a second. Any, any nays? Unanimous, just passed. Okay, we go on to the public comments portion. Citizens may be addressed to the council. Remarks are limited to three minutes per person. The total time of the public's comment is 15 minutes. Council may act on an item if it arose subsequent to posting of this agenda. The city council determines that an emergency exists. Two things we're going to shift gears this year. And between Charlotte and Ryan, we had discussion about the proper procedure for open public meetings, and we're going to do two things. First of all, had some people with that that we made sure that anyone speaking sticks to three minutes. So we have a timer. And I think the planning commission has moved here. And our planning commission <laughs> chair, it works, trust me. Uh, the police department, Mary Poppins, our planning commission chair is here, Bob Perry. Bob, you say something. We uh, gave it a test. minutes in two and a half minutes the, the, the uh, yellow light flashes and it beeps and in 10 seconds it will work and it, it beeps again and then it, in three minutes or up it goes red so we can start the evening. okay so previous council made an issue with it and I'm sure the count, current council would like to make sure and it's part of the reason being is then everybody gets a chance to talk during the 15 minute time frame that we uh, set aside so that's the first thing uh, the other thing that we talked about as far as open meetings are concerned is uh, the state code when it talks about the Open Meeting Act, if the council is going to discuss something, it needs to be on the agenda. So if a council member wants something on the agenda, then they need to, they need to let me, the mayor, know they'd like to have something on the agenda for the next council meeting. Uh, and then the other thing we're talking about, and I know some of the council members said, can we have an agenda and all the packet the week before we've done it Thursday or 
Friday the board, but they'd like to have more time to review the material, do their homework, do their research, um, so that they're plenty prepared. Uh, when Ryan and I discussed this, we said we've got what we call a pipeline that's going through the uh, planning commission. And if it comes through the planning commission, um, then, and it happened a week before, came out of the planning commission, referred to the council, then we'll pick something that was from the previous week. If not, then it's, then we need two weeks to get something on the agenda. And that gives the staff plenty of time, that gives the council plenty of time. So if something comes up during public comment, we'll refer it to the city staff, to get back to the resident, to get back to the council members, uh, and, and we'll make sure that they, they follow through. Uh, and if the council member wants something on the agenda, then they can request it to be on the agenda for the next council meeting. The next council meeting is the fifth, one after that, we have 14 days later, February 19th. The, uh, the first and third Wednesdays of every month. So, now, with that, we'll go ahead with the public comment. Anyone would like to speak, please raise your hand. Uh, and I'll recognize you. And you come forward, give us your name, Steve. My name is Steve Simmons. I live at 210 East, 2100 South, Cache County. The city is my neighbor. Uh, and you also have annexed a portion of my front lawn. I would like to ask the new council to revisit the issue of the development of 700 South to avoid spending hundreds of thousands of taxpayer dollars the necessary eminent domain against my property when you suddenly discover that the half partial road isn't wide enough to meet state law for a major traffic corridor as listed on your master plan. There is the developer did nothing from the June meeting when I spoke last until the last week of November when they have been working nonstop. They have generators out, heating the ground to try and keep the frost out so they can pour concrete. It needs to be addressed or you're going to find yourself in a position of spending more taxpayer money to take land away from me because of the quarter of an acre you're giving the developer to sell as a building lot. Uh, thank you. Uh, one of my neighbors has passed out a handout. It kind of outlines some of our things. On the back, there is a couple of illustrations. One illustration is a hypothetical that I shared with the developer last June. So if they would know there is another way where everyone would be happy. They get their development and lots. The city gets their east-west road, and we get left alone. The other simply illustrates the fact that if you continue and want the road to be a straight road and not snake around, you're going to have a series of eminent domains on everybody on the south side. So you have big empty fields on the north and you have finished homes on the south. My 1.3 acre parcel is never going to be purchased by a developer who's going to build the other half of your road for you after paying me the market value and then to tear down my five bedroom three bath house and subdivide the remaining acre and expect to make money. It is a fantasy. So I would also like to point out that I seriously protest the idea that all of us who participated in the lawsuit against the city have had our property marked on the new master plan as commercial. I don't think the developer or anyone in the city wants me to sell my property to a vape shop or a porno house. We are private residences, not commercial property. And it would be a nice consideration if you were to respect that and not look to sound vindictive at the city because you lost the lawsuit. I thank you. David Austin. 
I'd like to address to council. Laura? Anything else I'd like to address to council this evening? Anyone would like to address the council before you raise your hand? Mine has to do with the next agenda item. Can you come on up? Uh, yeah. If it's on the agenda, then we'll, uh, we'll wait. Yeah. Wait until it's on the agenda. My question is about the next item, which is the impact fees. My name is Nathan. Would you like me to talk now or can wait for that point? Uh, <coughs> we'll give you three minutes. You can say that we're going to have a discussion amongst the council when we get to that agenda item. So that is on the uh, during the public hearing. So we'll invite comments from the public on that issue. So. Okay, I'll tell you now. You can. Well, you got three minutes. You can use up your three minutes now. Thank you. But I appreciate your time. So you will be discussing um, increasing impact fees for new residences, and I'm sure that's based on the sewer fees being increased by Logan City, which is understandable. And I just want to suggest to the council this may be a good time to look at all of your impact fees. I know you have impact fees for roads and parks, and I think historically we've taken money from from impact fees for parks and not use them for new parks. Sometimes you have, sometimes you have. But I'm just wondering if we should maybe change that a little bit and spend more money or take more money on impact fees for roads to improve our city roads and less money towards parks. It seems like when you have an abundance of money from parks and not have new parks to build, instead of returning that money to what would pay the fees, you just throw it towards the softball or baseball fields, which I think there's been plenty of money spent on those items. So I would suggest maybe now is a good time to look at look that look at that and then maybe pick lower the park fees and raise the road fees. That's my comment. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, public comment portion. Anyone else like to speak? I see no more hands raised, so we'll go ahead and close the public comment portion and we'll move on to the public hearing. Um, and we have We have someone here to address us from Logan City to help us understand uh, Logan City's perspective on the impact fee. Um, but I also might note that the whole impact fee issue is pretty complex. We do plan to have a training session for the council to go into depth on impact fees. We could spend hours on it. Uh, full disclosure, I represent Providence City on Logan City Wastewater Rate Setting Committee, and um, along with uh, all of the other contract cities that Logan serves. So I've spent four years representing Providence City on the Rate Setting Committee, and um, so I'm knowledgeable, but uh, the council can ask questions, uh, members of the public can ask questions. Issa Hamoud is here. He's our Logan City's Environmental Department Director, uh, besides uh, wastewater, you, you also have, you don't have to repeat yes. that all the time. I would be more than happy to no, take three um, minutes. No, <laughs> um, you also have solid waste and other yes. uh, environmental. Okay, so, and, sure. you, and you report to the mayor? Yes. Okay, all right. Yeah. Lisa, please go ahead and give us your good evening. I'm not the best guy to address impact fee myself. We have a consultant who put together this report that I'm assuming you probably have already with you. That's good, yeah. And they're not available tonight. Uh, the um, fellow who put this report together, he said it's not available. So I'm here and with a good guy, I'll do my best I can uh, to answer questions. But in general, let me just give you some background about system some of you may know I'm hearing that several of you are new so uh, maybe I'll do the best I can to give you you know some background information about this the city of Logan owns and operates sewer treatment system uh, and several other cities are connected to us that is mainly Providence Timber Heights um, North Logan High Park Smithfield and USU these other cities, as well as USU, they are in contract with us. So we have a contract with you to treat 
this order. And due to the fact that water quality standards have changed several times over the years, we've got to the point that the Ramoops zone we currently operate is not adequate to meet those requirements. So the state of Utah requires that we must build a new treatment system, and that's something we're engaging on presently, and that treatment plant is about $150 million that we're building. It is adequate to treat the other cities as well as Golden City sewer. It's 18 million gallons capacity, and currently we treat on average about 40 million gallons per day. So we have additional 4 million gallons capacity that we're holding for growth, and that growth can be any city or all the cities. The current residents that are presently on homes or living in these communities have been paying through the Lagoons treatment system as well as setting money aside for the new treatment system. So when it was, you know, it started to build the new treatment system, we told you we had to pay the union over this. That is paid by you and others that live in the district. So we use that $30 million as a down payment to build, and we borrowed about another $100 million from the state of Utah. So that's where we are right now. The question is what we're going to do with our capacity. Those are our newcomers that are going to come into our system, whether it is in Providence, Midway, or Logan City. Like any other utility, we want them to pay their way in. And that's in that two study done by Russian, and they determined that that cost is $2,460. So what we're asking you in this report is to adjust that. And we followed the process that, as Mayor indicated, we've taken these two representatives of the cities that serve into the setting committee. They have reviewed it, they've asked it questions, and they have approved it. But Logan City cannot adopt impact fee for you. It is your city's responsibility, your council's responsibility to adopt that impact fee. So we bring that to you. Logan City will adopt its own citizens, and we're asking every city to adopt their own citizens. So Smithfield already adopted, High Park adopted, North Logan is in the process, River Heights adopted, and we expect that you and Midway as well as North Logan within a month to adopt these impact fees so that when we know every city adopted, we will have 90 days from the last entity that adopted the impact fee to implement it. Right now we have the date of April 1st in implementation. Our suggestion was to push this back by July 1st, but somehow it's in the middle of the construction season in July. We'd rather adopt it early than in the middle of the construction season. For that reason, the implementation date is set at April 1st. If you delay a little bit here and there, we understand and we'll work around it. So that's where we are. Any questions, if you have them, that would be more than happy to answer. Do we have to have it implemented before you get construction? No, we're already under construction. Yes. On that note, I would... On that note, I have your Department of Environmental Quality report in front of me. I would just note to the council that Logan City is required by its funding agency to adopt, to implement an impact fee. So they are required based on their permanent funding agency by the time construction is completed. So you would assume your completion would be 18 months. But by that point, they have to have adopted in order to fulfill their bond covenant. Is that correct? Yeah, it has to be in place before we begin operating the new system. So can you clarify the April 1st deadline? 
The April 1st deadline is something that the council, I mean, the committee, the Crape Setting Committee established that deadline, which means we want it to adopt before that, so there will be 90 days after that, and we can then implement the Crape Setting. So even if you adopt tonight, you're already behind with the deadline. So we might have to push that. One other question I would have, Mayor, if you would, uh, is has Logan adopted? The question is, has Logan adopted? Logan is waiting all the other cities to adopt before they adopt, so that's where we are right now. We're, and, and again, I, I hear one of your citizens is here suggesting that why don't you hook all the other impact fees? Logan is actually doing that right now, looking all the impact fees rather than just this one. Ours are in process also. What precedes an uh, impact fee study or rate study yes. is a capital facilities plan. And the only time impact fees are assessed on new construction is for additional capacity. It's not money for uh, maintenance. It's not money for sure. repair. Um, it's, uh, it's not something we have the rate study determines what the maximum the city can charge. Right. Uh, we can, as a council, we could choose something less. But then the city absorbs the difference. Sure. So um, it's not something where we say, well, Nibley charges this rate, and you charge this rate for parts. The two aren't comparable, because what we have in Providence, what other cities have for impact fees, what their capital facilities they built for him for additional growth varies by every single city. So we can't shift impact fee money around. So I'll, I'll give you a brief example and we'll move on. But it was 20 some years ago, uh, there was an impact fee study done in the capital facilities plan. For those of you who live on the south end of the city, a lot of it was involved in south. Uh, the rate study came back from an outside firm that has to be approved by the state of Utah. Um, we picked the firm that does it, but they, it's, it's, it's an outside financial firm that does that kind of consulting. They said the road impact fee is $3,368. The council decided that's way too much. We're going to charge $500. So now think about that, what I said a few minutes ago. Essentially, the difference between $500 that the city is collecting and the $3,368 to add additional road capacity the residents of the city of Providence absorbed, and that was the council choice 20 plus years ago. Um, so <coughs> that was an upper limit. Um, uh, we'll get, we'll drill down into the whole impact fee theory of how it works uh, when we do have a training session, which we'll maybe discuss the number of financial issues we want to cover. And we'll ask the council when we can meet so we can get on everybody's schedule. But this is just about. Impact fees, and this is just wastewater treatment. And as Ethan mentioned, we had a lagoon system. Logan has um, basically there was maintenance and repair, no capital expense to all the to Logan City and the contract cities. Carbon and environmental quality, we call it CEQ. Come back, and I think it's nitrate level and phosphorus. Nitrate and phosphorus level being discharged in the Culver Reservoir did not meet the new standards. Logan City. We have to come up with a plan to, to, to build a new, what's called a mechanical plant to treat wastewater so it's the, big, the, the discharge from that plant is significantly improved. So the impact is on, on current residents and the impact is also on uh, future residents as well. The city has paid in to build that plant, so it's new residents coming in, new construction that pays for capital and then of course it impacts the maintenance and operating costs. So in a nutshell that's where we're at, but I know it's a lot more complex. Let's see if the head's nodding. When uh, I see here there's a, a clause where the mayor will say adjust the impact fee. Does that mean that the council of Vanover has to be adjusted or does Logan City automatically be able to do that by approving this one? No, we would have to go to the uh, great setting committee there are a lot of reasons why we want to preview this again after five years. Uh, things can change. And uh, so if we find it uh, in the meeting, 
decrease. We will find it. Uh, we want it to decrease. We will go to the page telling the family, and then I will come back to those who will have that information at the council level. We cannot adapt. adapt. When I was first months on planning and zoning, I asked a lot of questions that were dumb, but they were meant for me to learn something. So this may be one of those. Uh, just to clarify, the, the impact can be disconnected from any sort of contractual agreement that we have with Logan City to treat our wastewater. Is that, is that right? There's a different contract that we have to do that. Yeah, there, we have actually two interlocal agreements. Okay. Uh, the first one is one that is between uh, Providence and Logan City. It basically says that we're willing to uh, uh, accept your sewer and this is the cost and we told you that whatever we do we do. So if we are just in that too, we will proceed to adapt. There is you know, there's no way that we can treat your sewer less than what we charge our own city. So that's one. The second interlocal agreement is all the other entities, including this one, all of them have one interlocal agreement rate setting committee whereby that committee makes the decisions in terms of increasing rates or decreasing. And the intent was to make sure and be transparent so that we all be the same rate. Okay. I thank you. That's helpful. So just to clarify those those two agreements, what are the terms of those agreements? Like what are I would be more than happy to say. Terms in terms of duration is what I was wondering. Uh, in fact, your uh, agreement with Logan City is directly, uh, you know, uh, Providence and Logan City right now expired, but we increase every year. It, it renews itself. So it's, a, it's an annual, automatic annual renewal. Yes. Rate, is that yeah. Okay. Um, my second question had to do with Clause B2, um, which I'm assuming, even though this is in our ordinance, it comes directly from something you wrote. No, that is your ordinance. I believe the, the red box is the only area that. And, and this see. looks reddish brown. Looks like wastewater. <laughs> yeah. So, awesome. um, since uh, let's, it's just regarding the non standard impact fee. That was one of the. I'm looking at page five or seven of our ordinance, but it's B2. So, it's um, just where that is. Number one sets the fee. Number two talks about a non-standard impact fee. I have five or seven here. Maybe we have an update. Yeah. Maybe at the top of the page, number two. Number two there. Okay. Non-standard for commercial and industrial facilities. Yes. So, so non-standard for commercial, industrial, public facilities, multifamily residential units. Mm -hmm. um, and then it says the last line, the City of Logan Environmental Director or its designee, that's you or the designee, is that correct? Yes. Um, is responsible for the assessment and adjustment of the non-standard fee. I guess my question is, um, we typically don't allow, we typically try to provide constructs within government to avoid fee one or more individuals setting fees. Is there a methodology that you're bound yes. to in terms of setting that that's yes. not spelled out here? Yeah, what this is that, have a single family person is 2,400 square feet. Multi family, we expect it to be less than that because they use the less space. So the intent here is to calculate and charge them less than, let's say, a single family. Oh, yeah, I understand. I'm just wondering if so is, there, is, there, is there a table that you oh, use yeah. or we, something? We would ask the engineer who designed it to that facility to provide us the calculation is over 12. And, and then, then you'll go proportionally, proportionally assign that. Yep. Okay. You got it. Correct. Thank you. One of my comments to Josh this point, if I might. Um, my recommendation in this ordinance, because it was in it, the red part, did come from the Lewis and Young. Um, so they did take it, but they just did, you know, completely yeah. took out. Um, I would recommend that, that the reference to Logan. The ordinance instead of Logan City, it just it specify just city so that it's in, it's in control of, of, uh, of Providence City rather than Logan City. And I would strike any reference to the Logan Environmental Director out of the ordinance so that it is uh, instead the city or its designee. So at that point, it is the council can do that, or, or it's, or it's me or the designee that you have. Um, 
um, we could work on our inside, or we may designate them to um, each other at that point to collect and control. So that, that would be my recommendation throughout the document is to strike Logan um, and, and strike the Logan Environment Director because she's specifically inside of our So Ryan, does that adjustment need to be made prior to moving on either the capacity? Within, or either within a motion or before uh, adoption of the, of the resolution. If you adopt it as is, then that wouldn't be the case. But I would make those rec I would recommend those recommendations before that you pass it. So, so we have a discussion item on this. I think get through our agenda tonight. We'll, we'll get into that. Ryan and I and Scarlett have had this discussion and there's a language that, as Lisa mentioned, is sample language uh, in draft and it's just suggested language. We can write the ordinance any way we want. It suits us for our circumstances uh, here in Providence and that's what we'll do. Uh, but we can have a council discussion on that, but this, this one item is, is, to, is the draft. Again, it's a discussion item. We're not voting tonight. The, the version that we're going to vote on will be vetted. The council will have plenty of time uh, for input. Our city staff will have time to review it and come up with suggested uh, language. And all the council will have a chance to read that amended draft before we, we have a council meeting where we actually uh, take it up for vote. Just to be clear, um, to be is that uh, what suggestion by me, uh, I have no problem. At some point in time, we need to keep uniformity in the whole system, where we will charge the same if you are in North Logan or Smithfield or Logan and in Providence. So um, I will leave it to Ryan how he wants to circle it to our office so that we will have at least the opportunity to look into and make sure that the rate is the same as what we would have charged other Okay. Council, any questions of Issa? I think we're done with one of the public uh, <coughs> hearings. Council, we're done? Oh, thank you, Issa. Thank you. Appreciate your comments. I'm sure Issa is available for further questions. Uh, you can contact him directly or support him. All right, let's go on to the public hearing uh, impact fee for wastewater treatment facilities. Uh, public uh, Providence intends to amend public. City Code Title IX, Chapter 1A, impact fees. By amending the impact fee enactment for wastewater treatment facilities, and adopt a wastewater treatment impact fee facility plan, approving a resolution uh, adjusting uh, the impact fee schedule. So I think we're going to be doing two things when we actually vote on this, not tonight, Scarlett. So there'll be an ordinance to adopt the new uh, language for our city code. There'll also be a resolution to pass the fee itself. So there'll be two agenda items we're actually on this. Okay, uh, so that's where we're at. We'll ask members of the public if they'd like to uh, comment. This is a public hearing. Raise your hand. I'll recognize you. And welcome to ask any questions you want. sometimes that take place within the city for the sewer system and other infrastructure. The impact fee is not directly related to that by any means, and nor can it be, correct? You're absolutely right. Okay. It's closely governed by state code. Okay. And, and the, the, the rate study is done by an outside firm that has to follow the state code when they determine the impact fee. Okay. And yes, you're right. It can't, it can't, it, it can't say, let's fix this street. 
budget that and put it in our capital fund. That's why you put on the first hour. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, I know there was a date of April 6th, April 1st thrown out there of changing this. Is that correct? That was correct. Which day it was? It was a State recommended State. date that they just wanted everybody on board. But, and that's when you would start implementing a new fee? The fee would go into effect 90 days after the city approves it. Okay. I think that's fair. I was going to suggest if you're going to have that fee go up at April 1st, that's not very fair to a lot of builders who have made and bid homes and then they would be forced to absorb that fee. To, but, if you, but if you're 90 days after that, that gives people a, a chance to adjust their bid or their pricing on the site of the home. So, so the other contract cities are Smithfield, High Park, North Logan, Midley, the Timothy Bill uh, Utah State. What did I miss? Did I miss? Yeah. Uh, so it, it's impacting all of the bigger cities here. Yeah, let stand here. Go ahead. I, because you're a builder, that's why I wanted to ask you if we implemented the full amount of the fee, do you see any reason why that would be taken to three years? I mean, I don't know why the council 20 some odd years ago decided to do something like $500 instead of $150 here. But Are we like, talking about the, the wastewater fee or is that about the utility fee? The, the amount of impact fee that's per lot. How much does that affect, in your opinion, I guess, the people coming and buying a lot and building? I think people are going to buy lots because they like the lot or like the location of where the lot is or the city in which it's in. Um, if you are astronomical in your fees, like Wellsville City is, people are going to be deterred from building there. Um, if you're talking about a couple thousand dollars, I don't think it would change it. Whatever the rate study determines is a maximum the city can charge if they charge less. But keep in mind, I mean, I used that example from 20 plus years ago. If the city residents are subsidizing, the city gets the bill anyway. We're going to get a bill for every new resident that's built for $2,400 or $68, I think is the impact fee from the city. The city is going to pay them. Now, if the council decides it's going to be $500, that means the residents pick up the difference. <laughs> in essence, 20 plus years ago, the council said, we are going to encourage development and impact on new development coming to Providence City by only charging $500. And in essence, the residents of Providence City since then, uh, up until, I don't know how, how many years, um, subsidizing all. So in a nutshell, that's it. So the cost of the city is still there, regardless of whether the council decides that they want to charge something. Anyone else in the audience? Okay, I uh, don't see any hands raised, so we'll call the manager from the hearing and we will move along. All right. Um, council members, I know this question came up before, and I think all of you were here on December 4th. Uh, we now do an agenda that's got, we break out administrative and legislative items, and I think when we talked about during the training session, talked about what the difference was. Administrative items, uh, the council was basically saying uh, in making this, uh, uh, we are acting in a way that we're determining whether the decision we're going to make follows or the petition we're going to approve follows city code. A legislative item is something where we're talking about a policy issue. It could be zoning related. Uh, it could be a rezone. Could be an ordinance where we're changing the code. That's a legislative policy item where we do invite discussion um, and we do bring the public in and we do consider uh, public input. So that's the difference. Tonight we've got uh, three administrative uh, items. Uh, we've got two. We've got two uh, planning commission openings that have come up. Um, our planning commission chairman took a church assignment. He and his wife. And uh, Gary Sontag, uh, so they, Gary resigned. Uh, Bob Perry was the vice chair, so Bob, who's in our audience here, uh, stepped into that.
that position, so that opened up that one slot. Um, Josh Paulson was on the Planning Commission, and when Josh was elected, uh, he had to resign from his position on the Planning Commission. That leaves two people. The Planning Commission uh, has, has five votes. We have two alternates, so whoever's elected will, will be alternates. So when someone on the Planning Commission resigns, or their term expires, then uh, the alternates move into uh, the regular position. That means they get to vote. But it also means if we have a regular voting member absent, then one of the alternates, the next voting <laughs> does get to vote. So that's how the Planning Commission uh, works. So we've got these two slots. Uh, as mayor, other than Rowan Cecil, every member of the Planning Commission is somebody that I've sought out and I've invited. Courage to uh, put their hat in the ring so they could be considered for the planning commission. Uh, so, and I reached out to a number of people, I can name who those people are, that just said, uh, I'll think about it. And then I thought about it, and I I guess that uh, it wasn't something that they could do. Anyway, um, but we have two gentlemen here tonight. We have Michael Fortune, uh, who approached us and said, I'd like to serve. We have uh, Alex Berenson, who served in 2018. Alex, how long did you serve? Was it like three months? Yeah. Uh, you, you can tell us that story. And so we're going to vote on that tonight. It's a council decision, mayor's recommendation. Alex, why don't you come up and introduce yourself? Um, tell us about, give us your background. We have your, your bio here. The council has. I've sent it out to them electronically, so we've got a copy of it as well. Um, and also tell us why you'd like to so initially when I came last year as well, my whole thing was I've been involved in developing projects in other cities and I just didn't like to be away from everyone. And I knew to complain about it, but I was like, I could join and help out in my own community. And so yeah, I'm, I'm a resident of Providence. I've lived here for 32 years. My home living here, hopefully for another 32 years. Um, and yeah, I'm just, I want my kids to have a good future. I want them, I want them to grow up with opportunity and I want it to be well planned and, and well thought out and not thrown together for the here and now. And I think my perspective is quite a bit different than, than most and than perhaps older generations and that and things are changing. And so we need to adapt and we need to we need to plan for the future. It's gonna be different. And so yeah. And currently I, I was in the recycling industry and ran a business. We had forty five employees um, in one business and then three employees in the other. But anyway, that that didn't work out. Um, right now I'm actually getting involved planning to come to Providence at some point? Not currently. I'm sure we'll make it known at the vote. I'll, I'll just commercial, work. residential, industrial? You know, it, it can be mainly commercial and residential. And so, yeah, I'll be working a lot with, in the area, like a lot with engineers and building some cities in other communities. And so hopefully I can bring some input from there and the, the good and not the bad. So, and you also understand City attorney has been working with you on that. Yeah. And you probably ought to do that. And yeah. have a conversation with him when he's counsel decides to appoint you. Yeah. I'm going to try to keep my distance from Providence just because we're the problem here. But, but we'll see. Things may pop up. So. Okay. Then. Counsel, you have any questions for Alex? Uh, yes. Can
Everybody go. I'm Ms. Marcy
to approve Michael working with the alternate member for the planning commission. I'll make a motion to approve item number two, resolution 0242. Motion from Councilor Lucia. I'll second. Motion from Councilor Strap. Second. Councilor Grove. All in favor? Aye. 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 Nay. Unanimous. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. What is our, Bob, what is our first next uh, planning commission meeting? Once we, next, or next week. Next week. That's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So today, 22nd. So then we'll have swearing ceremony. Swearing in ceremony. Not, not, <laughs> swe swearing. not swearing. Not swearing. <laughs> Only the council gets to do that. <laughs> um, we'll have a swearing in ceremony on, uh, just before the planning commission meeting, so we'll see both of you on the 22nd. Thank you very much for being here. We appreciate your service. And you're welcome to stay. All right, let's move on. So, item number three, uh, resolution 0032020. Uh, we've got uh, amendment to the bylaws. Planning for the planning commission. Bob, can you give us your two cents on what we're talking about amendment? I haven't seen these yet. You haven't seen the amendment? No. I've seen the amendments. What do we have for an amendment, Brian? And, and what did we need to change just so the council was. I think it's about the training from the policy. Okay. So if he sees it, he'll know. I'm pretty sure he'll. You'll realize when you see it. Yep. Do we have the microphone, yep. please? Brian, you can oh, have the microphone when you. Yeah. Oh, no. Uh, Bob can, can talk to it. I, I think Bob will see As he sees it, I think he'll know what it was. So, yeah. Whoever talks to you gets the, gets the favor of a microphone. Has the uh, council got that sheet of paper in front of them? The amendment to the uh, planning commission bylaws. It's in red. On page one of two. Basically, it says newly appointed planning commission members will initially be appointed alternates to the commission. It is advised that within 90 days of appointment dates, alternates attend relevant training scheduled by Providence City consisting of Land Use 101. Current commission members shall continue annual training while a member of the commission. Uh, there is another sentence in there that we don't have about uh, the appointment of a training chair. That's correct. I mean, so we'll have a, a training, somebody responsible for doing this training. But and maintain that uh, schedule. Correct. Questions from the council? We just felt that uh, as a planning commission, member uh, you need to be updated on certain things and I think training is the only way to get updated uh, that deals with open meetings law um, there was a few other things in the training that uh, happens you can pick that up online or we can do that at USU training session I think it's held one uh, every year right around January December no I think it was November that we had it this year so land use 101 yeah. They actually offer it several times throughout the year, and we can take advantage of it. They do it um, via electronically. We can yep. sit in and watch the and participate in the meeting. The or thing. online. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> so there's numerous ways that a uh, new planning commission member can get trained. Uh, are you having your vice chair keep track of all the training? Kathleen Alter is the training chair at this point. That's vice chair. Vice chair, okay. Good. Okay. I don't have a question, but just uh, just much appreciated working with the other planning commission. I'm glad to see the chair in that and doing a good job with that. It's great to see these bylaws coming, coming out. So thanks for that, Bob. Thank you. Yeah, I agree that the 
training should happen. I'm wondering if we should be less specific about what the annual training is or the initial training, just in case it changes so that it so that it doesn't have to be amended with if the state changes, for example, the name of the training land use 101. Is that right now? That's the name of that. That's the name of that class. Right. And I just don't know if that will stick or we could simply add or equivalent or that. Yes. I remember taking that training when I was on the planning and zoning, and that is some of the best education. There's a lot of information in that. Not only training. It's like it lasts like a day or two days. That was four hours. That was a different training procedure. I had it called citizen planner. And it was probably about 16 hours or 20 hours of training. It went over several. They still have that. No, they they condensed into one that opportunities. The one that we're talking about here is a four hour class on a Saturday at the university. Distance learning. Yes. And you have. Did you want the sentence added about to the training? It's officially in our bylaws. I think it's just inadvertently not added. But yes, to answer your question. Yes, I'd like to have it. So when you make your motion, please say with the amendment adding or equivalent and that the planning commission will select a training chair. So you have a motion. Well, maybe I'm supposed to have a motion. I don't know. We'll have to second that. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I have a question on the motion, but I'll make the motion. There's no motion. There is no motion. So ask the question. Oh, I'll ask it now. I guess it's probably a question for you, Ryan. Just a procedural matter. I'm just wondering administrative business items. Are we looking for the conformance with state or city code? You know, whether or not we're approving them. This one is being a resolution and bylaws. Would this have the it's not legislative. So would it have the enforcement? The bylaws would have the enforcement of law. No. OK, so so it would just be green to be nice and operate by these things. Correct. That's why I wanted to clarify. I'd like to make a motion that we approve. So one of the things before you move on, the council bylaws are also don't have the force of law. And I do know the council bylaws say in there that they don't have the force of law. And I think the planning commission bylaws say the same thing. I think that we had it quite a bit when we just did our bylaws. So no, but no. Council Council Metropolitan, you're right. It's just procedures we've adopted. Yeah. And we and any council can amend these changes. All right. Now, do I have a motion? OK, I'll make a motion to approve item number three resolution 003 dash 2020 planning commission bylaws. I have a second for that. Just a clarification. Final point. Are you including the or equivalent and the with the amendment or equivalent and the training to the land and the training? Right. Thank you. I just making sure that was included or not. So I'll second that. All right. Now, second to the amended motion. Yes. OK, from Councilwoman Hex. So. All right. Let's move on. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Okay. Unanimous. Thank you both. Thank you. I think it's important that we do get all trained and it just makes us act a little bit more professional when things pop up. Thank you. I just want to mention one thing about training. The council or the we as a council get inundated when the legislature meets and has 1200 bills. It considers and they usually end up passing 300 to 400 and it's to me the 45 days the legislature is in session is an ultra marathon. I don't know how the legislators and I know the number of including our state senators 79 years old can can endure the four or five hours sleep that they have. Nevertheless, in 
invariably something gets imposed on city government that we need to, we need to keep all of us in the loop on as the legislature is debating and discussing these and after they pass them then, uh, and then the governor typically signs them sometime in May. So one of the things we'll be discussing is, is what those things are coming our way and probably invite someone um, from our state representative, Casey Snyder, here and talk about things the legislature is either discussing or has, uh, has passed. So, uh, the changes to the tax law are number one on top of the list of uh, issues that, that everybody in the legislature and, and municipal governments are talking about because it affects our city as far as tax revenue. We're not sure what that impact is going to be. Uh, I know when I went to Macy's the other day, People gathering signatures to put a referendum on the ballot for a place was something that the legislature hasn't even debated yet. But it still looks like an issue. Anyway, thanks for that. So, all right. Uh, we have uh, one uh, discussion item, legislative item, and, and, and it's, it's, in, it's when the council passes something uh, that amends our code, it's called an ordinance. Once it amends the code, it becomes part of the code. So just so we get the terminology right, uh, this is the impact fee from wastewater treatment facilities. Uh, again, this is a discussion item from the city council to discuss proposed ordinance adopting an impact fee facilities plan uh, and a uh, uh, fee enactment for wastewater treatment facilities. So as I mentioned to Scarlett, when we do get this on the agenda, we're going to have two things. One is to an ordinance to amend our code. Uh, the other is a resolution to uh, adopt a fee. <clears throat> and now what the question usually comes up is if we're going to adopt a fee, then we have to send builders to uh, or contractors to local city to pay the fee, or is Providence going to do it? And I think what cities collectively have all decided to do is the cities are going to collect the fee. Again, this is a discussion I am. Brian is much more knowledgeable about this than I am. I've had my head in the business for a while as well. So let's open this up to the council and just ask some questions. We do intend to have a training session. And uh, one thing I thought we would do is, is just to help us understand is Lewis Young, uh, Robertson, and Vernon, uh, who did this study, and one of their staff can come out how not just uh, this whole thing, but the whole issue of impact fees, but for our enjoyment. Just one just point to help with clarification for the council. Um, on number one, on the 5.7, we talked about number two previously, but the number one, that that rate is established and saying in ordinance. So what, what we're doing is saying we don't do it that way. We pull out the rates, put them that's kind of because Providence and, and because good practice is that you don't put your rates inside of ordinances and put them in this issue. So anyway, that's a best practice. So that's why it's a separate. That's why it's a separate. Uh, just to kind of clarify why, because this this ordinance has a rate in it, but that's a problem. We pull it out. We don't keep it. Council. Mayor, do we uh, currently collect um, fees uh, as building permit time during the city season, or is that collected at the county? So we collect impact fees here at the city, and the inspection fee is collected at the county. Uh, so it's building permit fee. What? Where so is that building collected? permit often.
the site plan side of view, or point of view, to make sure that it meets our zoning standards. When our zoning clearance is ready, then they come in and pick up that zoning clearance and they pay their impact fees, their connection fees, directly to Providence City. Then, once they have that, they can put that with their paperwork to file with Cache County, and Cache County will then collect that, collect that. Then at the end of the month, they remit Providence 20% back for those, for Providence's portion of those fees. And they take care of all the reporting to the state. Basically, uh, the uh, waste water treatment fee, and how often is that remitted to Lady City? That's yet to be determined. That's something we can decide how we want to. Well, because the interest would, if they, <coughs> say we collect at the time of the building permit, and we issue the payment at the time of certificate of occupancy, Logan is asking for, in our, in our account, in that particular sort of fund, it would be applicable. This sort of fund, they will pay that fund. And the interest for that interest is our opportunity to pay the current fund. Correct. Okay. And one other question, and that's on line one A two, one A. It says, and I'm, it's probably just my misunderstanding. Impact fees are hereby imposed as a condition of the issuance of the building permit by the city for any development activity which creates additional demand and need for public facilities for the culinary water system, wastewater sewer system, waste wa water treatment park, which is enacted uh, through the ordinance codified and so forth as we have there. Um, I'm wondering for this particular I understand that this is a basically an impact fee schedule. So we talk, identified culinary water. Uh, how do we? We're already charging a connection fee. Is that right? We charge. Do we charge a sewer connection fee? Uh, how do we designate them separately from? I guess I, I'm, any activity, which is culinary water, wastewater, have we got too much rolled into this one? That's my question. It, should it only so be a wastewater? Lot of, a lot of that is is the ordinance. They've taken the ordinance, redlined it, and added the canned language to our current ordinance. That's why it already includes say, hey, maybe we need to clean up this old ordinance that we have that they're feeding into. And that would be a question we could do at this time. But keep in mind the red is what they're adding. Um, and, and it's because of the new impact fee. They're not changing and adding any other ones with the regulation. It's just keeping the red line. So will this impact fee be part of the schedule that we will adopt? And we will have a new number here that references that, the impact fee. And who is currently charging the other impact fee? We currently charge. Um, impact fees for parks, for streets, and for water. Um, one of the things that you can note is that on page two, on 9-1-A-5, it talks about the adjustment of fees. So we actually can look at that and then compare that back to, to the, this was, this first part in black was written to, um, to establish that we can have an impact fee in these areas. Okay. And then because Logan City had some specific wording that, that, well, because the people that prepared Logan City's impact fee analysis, and because the state code has changed somewhat, we included their wording in red, specific to wastewater treatment. We had an impact fee study done a little while ago um, on road, and if we would have passed that, we would have included the new wording in red that's required by state code when adopting a new impact fee. So, so we need to look and make sure that 
our adjustment of fees doesn't conflict with the way the way the, the consultant has recommended for Logan City. The one on page two talks about that it's going to be the city council that makes that determination. So those are just some things that, that we need to look at. I need to apologize too. When I put this ordinance together, um, started on it, we were still in 2019 and it came up that we moved to 2020 and I didn't update the council name. So they will be updated, I'm corrected when we do our next ordinance, so. For future reference, could I um, request a copy of the impact fee schedule that we're charging on that for the other area? Is it on the website? It is on the website. Okay. There's there's a section on the website for yes, impact fee. Can you make a note to send the council a link to the all the fees on the uh, city website? Uh, Um, I was noticing that this looks like it, we're changing it to a chapter on an article and other things. An existing chapter. An existing chapter in the code. I just wondered why only wastewater treatment has specifics and it doesn't go into specifics for public facilities, pulmonary water, the sewer, parks, roads, there's no, is that you've only included the pertinent part for tonight or the other part exists or doesn't? Because when the other impact fees were put in place, the requirements in the ordinance were a bit different than they are now. So as we modify those other impact fees, when we we are currently looking at an impact fee facility plan for water, if we put that together and we come back to modify that, you will see a chapter on you will see a section on water similar to what you're seeing on wastewater. Because what we passed before, we did it under the code at that point in time, the state, the state code at that point in time. Now, as we make amendments to, the, to what we passed at that point in time, we add the new wording required by state code to make sure that everything is, um, you don't have to go back and rewrite your code until you make a change on certain things, as long as you met that code requirement. Also, one other question. They asked for the impact fee schedule. Um, this is for park integration 2007, the water one in 97. And those capacity related projects are the only ones that can be included in the impact fee. project that we wanted to completely resurface a road or completely rebuild a road but we it's definitely going to go into a capital facilities plan because it's not collect impact fees on it so that's the reason for the two the impact fee projects can be included in your capital
longer cases that haven't haven't been able to get through through uh, the attorney. So if there's any others, we'll take those. We'll get with the city attorney to make sure that all of those fit legal, um, and then we can come back. And that's what our hope would be is to come back to to the council at that point once any of the cases have been modified. So I think that would be great. Do we'll you have a second? an actual what we do out the door. Uh, the county to me issues a commit out the door for the voters. We'll, I, mean, I like so what if we strike by the city? What's that? What if we strike by the city? So at that point to be consistent that that that's the ultimate permit. That's right. Right. Yeah. 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 Or they really can't get the loan that they thought they were going to get. And so we do refund the impact fee um, at that point if they if there isn't going to be any impact. We refund that directly. We don't want to send that to Logan City until we have always issued so that if that problem happens, we can refund the impact fee directly from here rather than trying to get Logan City to to refund us and then we refund the proceeds. It also reduces it from, it, it keeps it instead of going to three different places to pay a fee, it keeps it simple. We're not adding a third. is to strike Logan and the reference to or the Environmental Service Department. I would strike both of those and leave it as city or designee will collect the wastewater treatment, wastewater impact fee. In so all places, right? In all, all places. places. Yeah. 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 So at that point, then it's the city. We, we can designate, if the council decides to designate the Logan City Environmental Service Department, they can, but they can also revoke that and it's not written in. I would remove that. That would be mine for all of those. California, any questions? I just want to make sure, well, in my opinion, we should assess it to the, the building as for the impact fee rather than making it less. Places it goes under Highway 165 that connects to Lewis, and it gets to the wastewater treatment plant. Everybody's every city plays the same rate per thousand gallons, so that's the same for every city. So when the city gets a bill, it's broken down between the collection management and treatment. on what we can assess, but do we adjust that fee without doing another analysis? If we were making the guidelines of the previous analysis, well, we don't pass that cap, can we adjust the fee? Is 
having them study. Um, when the study is done, there's a term that's called level of service. And I'll take the example of the parks. And when the study was done in 2007 or whatever that was, um, it said there are so many residents, there are so many acres of parks. So it said there are so many, for a thousand residents, there's so many acres of parks. So let's just pick a number, 1.8 acres or something like that. That's a little bit more. So that's the level of service, is 1.5 acres of park space per thousand residents. So the impact fee can only say as the city grows and we bring at that same level of service, but if the city in that capital plan decides that that 1.5 acres is going to be 2.5 acres, we've increased the level of service. But as a city, we can say we are going to have a higher level of service. We're going to have more park space. But that's not impact fee related. It's only at the current uh, level of service at one and a half, in my example. One and a half. Here's what does change. As you said, to your point about parks, I mean, pick a number. $30,000 per acre right now with $80,000. I don't know what it is. But, um, so, for the, as far as the city's concerned, when we're acquiring park space, it's going to cost the city more to acquire the park space than the capital plan allows them to. And automatically, not automatically, but that cascades down to a rate study for parks, which, which naturally dictates there's going to be a higher impact fee for parks, just because the land. If, if Logan came back, they've calculated in happens less than expected, then they've collected less money. They will raise the fee because it's still, still um, controlled by the city. But if it's a project you did, you paid down, or whatever. Well, if you were to do that, you would be saying, it is very important for us to get XYZ industrial. We want to have more jobs. We feel like reducing the impact fee for XYZ industrial type businesses will be offset by the creation of jobs, increasing our tax base, that type of thing. You can, the council can make that kind of a determination, but you cannot increase at all without a new study. And just adding to that, at the current language, you would go to a Logan city or director to have that modification. If you mend it, it's say Logan or designee, then it's yours to choose that. Or Providence, or, or Logan would, if you went to Logan, you'd have to do it here, or you'd have to, the Providence City would. would have it. So. Council, any, any other questions? Right, we <coughs> talked about having training and drilling and down at the impact piece. The, uh, the representative from Lewis Young couldn't make it tonight, so maybe we can have him come. We can piggyback, and Logan gets the bill to have him come in and talk about impact fees in generic sense, and talk about Logan specifically, and what he can do when he does so. He can talk about the state code and what the state code requires he had to do when he did the study for Logan State. Fred Philpott. We definitely can work with him. Okay. I sent out a little bit of a, just a snippet for, for some of the council to have some little training to understand pieces. But yeah, okay. we could have him come in. Absolutely. So you and I talked about a number of topics on financial issues. Did you send anything to council on here's what we're thinking about having a training and here's the topics we want to cover? I, I haven't asked okay. as far as a survey of when, but I have said uh, to the council, um, I did send out one. It was just small snippets. So what I'm trying to do is feed small snippets of that as we go. So you can eat the elephant one bite at a time rather than have huge hours and hours of training. But we do want to say, okay, when we do have those, we'll set those aside, have have good trainings. But I am trying to send out small little snippets to try to help. Oh, instead of having a training session. Yeah. Okay. So so we'll kind of play it by ear. Yeah. And we'll see what kind of see if the council are picking up and understanding the issues and they may want to ask and say, 
damages relate to. So the, the Utah League of City and Towns has two conferences a year. I would recommend all councilmen going to both of those um, each, each year. So because there's a lot of training, they do get a lot of that. And uh, if you go to those, they're, they're very valuable. So I would encourage you planning on that if you haven't. Um, let me know if you're able to go and we'll schedule that for you. I've heard from some, but I would encourage those um, as formal trainings as well. So. Anybody who's got any more questions? So let's move on. Uh, council reports. Um, Hang on, I think you've got the mayor put them on your agenda. I have. You have previous. Previous. Ones. Okay. We have a uh, okay. Appointment of Mayor Pro Tem Province City Council will choose a council member to serve as Mayor Pro Tem. So it's not a resolution, it's not an ordinance or voting on select one of the council members to serve in the absence of the mayor. For whatever reason the mayor may be absent, typically, traditionally, historically, the council has chosen the most senior member of the council to be mayor pro tem, and that would be Councilwoman Hackney. Uh, we've done that in the past. When I last year I served on the council, I was uh, mayor pro tem. Councilman Kirk was mayor pro tem. So we can change it every year if we want. There's Councilwoman X, who says I'm the. Uh, I'm all about it. I'd be happy to do it. She doesn't make a motion. Sure. Uh, we can discuss it further. You can ask Christina. You can ask what their duties are. One thing is, if someone's mayor pro tem, they do get to vote. So just because they they're acting as uh, chair of the meeting and they're acting as the mayor's. Absence, they still do retain their right to vote. The mayor does not vote. Anything else about Mayor Pro Tem? Man, one thing I would like to add, it doesn't happen very often, but once in a while, both the mayor and the mayor pro tem are out of town or ill or something like that. If you have a quorum, so that would leave four of you. And if the other four can meet, then at that meeting, you would select the mayor pro tem for that meeting. And, but as mayor, um, uh, it would only be for that meeting. So the four remaining would, would select who was going to act as mayor pro tem for that meeting. So that's how so the state code set up. So in some cities it has happened. And like Scarlett last year impressed on us. It's, it's really important to have a mayor pro tem. The city staff's got to get ready and prepare for a council meeting, get everything together. Get all of the attendees in the loop. Um, the, the only example I can think of uh, in North Logan, uh, uh, Tom Bailey, uh, not Tom Bailey, um, and within a couple months, he had there was a cancer that was in remission and then came back, and he was medically sidelined, and he said, "I, I, I, I can't, I can't serve as mayor." So the mayor pro tem served. I think a year and a half um, in his absence, and finally the council just said, uh, "We need to make a decision." So, um, so, so, so does the mayor pro tem set the agenda as a reminder about ahead of time that they're going to? The mayor's going to be absent, or does the mayor generally set the? Mayor generally sets the agenda, but uh, I mean perhaps. The mayor can't be present, but it's just a temporary thing. I mean, they're not disabled or incapacitated. They're just not able to attend for whatever reason. Um, the mayor still sets the agenda, and the mayor pro tem conducts the meeting. If the mayor is incapacitated, then city staff would work with the mayor pro tem. Um, any other 
three items in one. I'll bring it down to the rocks here. Just street side parking during the during the snowstorms, if that's been an issue at all. I unfortunately I don't drive all the city streets, so I don't know how bad it is for other neighborhoods. But I want to bring up we do have an issue, I believe, on 450 going up to Grandview with construction vehicles and trailers being parked that aren't don't have reflectors on them. So it's so dangerous. It's really into one lane road. And it feels like one lane. And it's it's if we see those, if you'll send us an email, we'll be 100% of the time. They haven't moved it all in. Yeah. Yeah. So I know you're trying to do this. Generally, I kind of like, is it a bad thing? But I agree with Christine and and Carrie, it's it's a safety issue, at least in this to to get items on the agenda. I'm just wondering is what I have learned from the Utah League of Cities and Towns trade, the more formalized we can make the procedures for some of these things and avoid confusion would be better. That's that was the interpretation. The agenda is set by the mayor. So understanding is, though, that the state code dictates that the mayor chairs chairs the meeting, but doesn't say anything about the in state code about the mayor setting the agenda for the meeting. He would by default. I'm wondering if it would be a good idea within our code to adopt a procedure that if multiple council members wanted something on the bylaws, bylaws wouldn't have the enforcement of law. So it's a case. I'm not saying that that's not the case. What I'm asking is for the council to consider perhaps a more enforceable and democratic way of setting the council. I think the council should have the option to go ahead and and place items on the agenda and that should be in our city code. An item if you request an item and it doesn't get on with the mayor, a two councilman can't call on you and at that point they can set from that call they can set an agenda. But normal regular council meetings they are set. But it doesn't there is in state law an ability for a two members of the council to call on you and then they would have that. If there wasn't if if at some point there was some reason we felt like well there's some you have an item and you don't have another council member state code. I've heard that I've been unable if you can find where that is I've been unable to find that in state code or our city code. I won't say that you can put it on the agenda but whatever you decide to do if if two council so that we can make sure that being in an emergency meeting emergency meetings you can post those a little differently if we had an emergency as long as we could get everybody if we can get a quorum here and we had to hold a meeting immediately as long as we posted as soon as we know emergency like we're having a flood and we've got to allocate money or something to do it. Anything else we have to have at least 24 hours notice on posting in order to make sure that we might meet all the requirements and just so we make sure we have staff available and reporting and everything. So we talked about having something adequate getting it on the agenda at least a week in advance or more right. I think it says 14 days if I'm not mistaken. So in our bylaws. In the two years I've been mayor there's nothing the council member has asked to put on the agenda that is not done. So if a councilman wants a councilwoman or a councilman wants something on the agenda there's time to to make it work. I would think if that's the case then then formalizing that would would wouldn't be an issue. Is there a concern about formalizing that if that's been the traditional practice? Can we move it from the bylaws to the city code? Yeah that's been the practice I'm just wondering if there's concern about formalizing that. I have any concern about putting it in the code. I'm just one person on this democratic process if they see that as being a good idea I think it should be discussed or entertained if not then I have to leave it on the floor. So just for clarification your your suggestion is to make the council members 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 the
counsel set the agenda and not make the recommendations? No, that's not the recommendation, but I don't think I'm on the agenda. So in the bylaws, I just just address it is 5.9. It's the agenda item. It does say any two members of the council can request an item that requests that an item will be added to an upcoming council meeting agenda as long as adequate notice is given to the city recorder in accordance with state code. So and it does have its own resolution. So at that point, it was a resolution and also included. So I mean, and this is a point of issue. If you want to have it, that's probably an agenda item that we probably should add to a council agenda. Oh, I would agree with that. And I understand the resolution. That may be the case. Let me say my position again. Just bring it to you. I think I think the room is it's unenforceable. I think it's a place to tell the police be enforceable. I think it'd be reasonable. So so if it's in a resolution, that's not something that's in the code resolution or something that's resolutions are in the code. But we'd ask your attorney. Your resolutions are generally enforceable, right? Enforceable or enforceable. So a resolution is enforceable. And but it is not written in the city code. I misunderstood because we just spoke about the bylaws for the planning commission today. And I thought I heard that those were not enforced bylaws. But this one was adopted by a resolution. Resolution 035. But the bylaws were also a resolution. They were resolution 035-2011. That's what I understood from our discussion earlier today. If that's not the case, I'm going to refer that. I'm going to refer that. So I know there was some discussion earlier about the bylaws not being enforceable. They're enforceable in the sense that the council has agreed on them. They're a contract with the council. They're not enforceable in the sense that you could be criminally punished for not following them if you tried to support them in some way. So any kind of resolution that you guys, that you members of the council make is, becomes law to your organization. So if there were some argument as to whether something, so the bylaws do govern and you should follow them. But there isn't a, let's say, a punishment for them in the criminal code. But there really isn't, in that sense, there isn't really a punishment for everything in the criminal code. There's certain things that get pointed out that there is this criminal punishment and so on and so forth and so on. Is anything that you come together as a resolution and you give as a resolution becomes your law for the city and it should be followed. I spent some time on the council and bring up these issues and say, or bring people to the council for instance, past or in the future that have been problems. I had to learn on my own, I think Monday night, the day before Tuesday council meeting, we had the agenda and I had to go and learn on my own. I was a Utah League of Cities and now didn't have one around here. Right? This way. So I've got a five final item. That's okay. When you talk about the resolutions being public. I don't think I was able to find those bylaws. The bylaws should be on the website, but the actual resolution is not. We'd like to send the bylaws out to everybody. Did you not get that? I'm still having email, my official Providence City email account issues. I know some people have it. I haven't been able to call the state. There's probably not quite a few emails that we can. When I tried to set mine up, it was like, it sends you a password reset to an email. 
it's not. But before I call the state, I have to like get pumped up for it and make sure it's done properly. Come in and I'll pump you up. We'll get pumped up. My final item is we, I think we have the public comment portions and I think they're important. It's nice to hear from Nathan today. And we heard from Steve Simmons. I met with Steve and some of his neighbors last night, trying to understand their perspective and the issues. I feel like they did a fair, you know, how much this potential here that would ultimately save the city quite a bit of money. It makes a lot of sense. So I, you know, I just asked my fellow council, council representatives, how they feel about it. If they've looked at these issues and if it's, if it's something that's warranted, I, I would advocate getting on the next agenda and try to sort it out. So we should probably put it on the agenda if we're going to discuss it. But I think there's a lot from the city staff we can learn. We have probably had Steve Simmons here a dozen times. We've addressed all of his issues and the neighbor's issues. There's a long, long history to the issue of 2100 South. Way beyond the important issue. And that's another story. It goes way beyond even our time. I got the seven year history. So, well, Steve's story and the city's story is dramatically different. And there are no plans for eminent domain. There are none. And we have an active development that's going on that it's just, I'll just say the term is, it's set in concrete. And if we were to tell the developer, we've decided we're going to, we want you to do something different, we would end up in court. So, but what we ought to do is, I mean, individually, a couple of council members at a time we can have, we can have a meeting and discuss it and discuss all of what we've done, all of what Steve's got here. Steve has written probably half a dozen nasty letters. And then those were letters that came from neighbors and his wife, how abusive and how horrible the city is. And so that's the Steve Simmons email. Anyway, that's my two cents. But if we're going to address these, the city staff needs to spend some time on them. And we can address them. We can have a council meeting and spend an hour or so or two on this. May I make one quick comment? This is an approved subdivision with an approved development agreement. I know that. I know that. So, Chad, we can't undo an approved subdivision. No, I know their vested rights are with the property owner, but we don't have to put the streets in as they may have been planned to put in. We can put the streets in. We can put our street, I mean, Steve's plan here. And this is what I'm asking, if this warrants discussion. No, we cannot move this street. We cannot force the developer at this time to amend his plat to put the street the way this picture shows. I know we can't force the developer to amend his street, but there's the remaining, the way that that street is put in. And this is why we're getting into a discussion, and this is why I wanted to bring it up. The remainder of that street to connect into the portion that the developer wants to do can be changed. Like we could potentially say, a future developer would have to put half the road in or something along those lines. There's no such thing as half the street, no matter how many times Steve Simmons says half the street. There's 24 feet of asphalt, which is more than adequate for traffic going in two directions. Are you talking about what's drawn here? Yeah, which I don't think is in view of this one. That one, this mass plan planning zone transportation plan draws the street as Steve has. But you should send the planning zone a note that says, hey, take a look. And it would be theirs to start, not planning zone. Or zoning should start in there, not in zone. Yes, I understand. I understand that's the case as well. And what I'm recommending is maybe that would need to happen. In this instance, it appears the road's going to go in that way, and we would, the city might incur quite a bit of burden taking property from some of these landowners from Steve Simmons' property up to Main Street at that point, or second last, excuse me, second last. All I'm saying is I don't see the issue as being totally resolved. I'm not sure what you're suggesting is a better option. Because I read through the emails that Scott sent. 
And I went and looked at the first page that he sent. But I just, given where the irrigation ditch is, I mean, you can't change where it's been plotted out. But then they can take into consideration all of the surrounding The city don't have to do that. What did the road is 30 feet, so what was the bottom of the road? Do we have to put in six more feet? No. For development. We have many parcels. But where's development going to come there? That's what I don't understand. Sometime in the future, we have to provide for it. It might be 20 years from now, or 30 years, or 50 years from now. But we as a city and councils have decided we're not going to require a developer for the entire road. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Is is there anything that we is there anything that we can do about it? Like we need it. If if there's if there's nothing we can do, if there's no way to make a win win, then then we send it back to planning and zoning to talk about roads. But if there's something that we can do, then I feel like it should go on the the agenda. At this point, you can't change the development as stands. You can change the adjacent ones, the laws according to it, so that when the adjacent ones come in, that they do something different. But as it stands with the current approved ones, I understand that. But the developer could, if the developer, if the, if the developer could. So if the yes. plans change for the the developer, the developer might go. I might be interested in, in redrawing my plans to coincide with what we the plans are. Force the developer to change. Yeah. So the developer has. The developer could have. I'm not implying forcing. I'm just thinking if the plans were different. I think the developer might take a second look at there. And and I would be curious in our current plans. I'm asking the city staff acquire their land and planning. If we have to acquire pieces of that, what it would end up costing. Well, the, the thing that's interesting, if you go back and read all of his letters to the editor, he's already accusing probably the city of eminent domain. Like the mayor said, there isn't any. Um, so I'm going to caution you. I didn't get the letter from him. He didn't send it to me. I'm I, I encouraged you. him to send it to you, by the way. Well, did, yeah. I just caution you to know that. Make sure that you get the whole story because there is so much underlying, um, there is so much history. Um, so, I mean, it's it's very complicated. Right, Scarlett? So, Josh, what I'm hearing is correct. If we revisit this thing and look at the properties east of there going up to Second West as a council and recommend planning and zoning, look at that property, the possibility of moving that road any further on the future development. Then the request might be we ask the developer of this property to revisit what he's doing for the possibility of making this reconnect. Okay. 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 Yeah. So for the development sunrise acres is I've been fault for this. Until you drive an area, look at it, and talk to people, you don't get a really good understanding of what's going on. And I compliment Janelle because I think she did that as soon as she got this letter. She drove down there and looked well, at and it. Well, and I've driven down yeah. there several times. Just so we know, when you go into closed session, you give a specific reason why you're going into closed session. From that conversation. So, <laughs> you can't talk about other things. So, if we don't have imminent litigation and we don't have current litigation, uh, we can't talk about it in executive session, right? There are a few more things you can talk about, but that is but what right, I talked about. Right. Yeah. For that, for that motion. Yes. So the motion can be amended to for litigation. It has to be specific. Why we're what are we going to talk okay. about? For example, it could be a personnel issue, uh, competency, and, and we have to say that we're going into it to discuss. The second thing is record what we're going into. Right, and then, right. 
to second the new food motion and come back out into because once we go in we can't make a motion inside so the motion has to be to close and then to come back to so you do get to make a motion to close inside but to take action on an item so to make There'll a final no action to take within the right to make a final decision that has to be done in a public meeting and you can word it in such a way that you're meeting all of the open meeting laws but you're not if you let's say that um, we needed to talk about pending litigation or acting and then say we're going to go in for those two reasons you don't have to go in for litigation come out and then go back in for um, one type of closed meeting it's just that if you only say litigation then you can't say oh by the way what are we doing about acquiring ABC property okay so I want to amend my <laughs> motion again this so, is so a take three is, is it can't <laughs> can't go into executive session to be discussed and it needs to be an agenda item for future council meetings for discussion yeah. so for example if there's an issue that council wants to discuss says let's go into executive session if it doesn't meet the criteria then it's going to be on have to be on February 5th <coughs> council meeting agenda to discuss okay so I move that we go into closed session to discuss current litigation as well as possible land acquisition or land acquisition questions. 